be talking again tonight out of, out of Matthew chapter 5, out of the Beatitudes, amen? And the Beatitudes of, of, of Christ, these are the marks of a disciple of Christ, amen? Matthew chapter 28 says that we are to be disciples of Christ. We are to make disciples of all nations, amen? Your life is to be a, a, a lifelong learner, a studier of the word of God, amen? How many of you like knowledge? Raise your hand, amen? But here's the deal. We have to seek the Lord and we have to ask the Lord for wisdom. Because knowledge without wisdom is useless. Wisdom is knowing the difference, knowing when to apply it, how to apply it, asking God and depending on God, saying, Lord, speak to me so that I know, Lord, how to, yeah, how to apply this book effectively to my life, how to apply this truth that you would speak to me, Lord, every single day. Amen? And so we need the word of God. I want to quickly recap with you tonight. I have a few minutes to speak to you. Last week we were looking at Matthew 5.4. How many of you remember Matthew 5.4? If you know it, say it. Blessed are those who mourn. Uh-huh. For they will what? Be comforted. <laughs> Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We looked at two things out of this scripture in two, two main points that we learned about it. And that is this, is that a sinner who mourns will be comforted. Amen. A sinner who mourns will be comforted. 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and it leaves no regret. Amen. How many of you know that sin leaves regret? Amen. But godly sorrow, that is, that is having a, a, a true you know, desire that you know that you've offended the lover of your soul. You realize that it's God that you sinned against. It wasn't just, you know, against a book. It wasn't just against the letter. But you realize that God is a person and that when we sin, we break the heart of God. Because he has sent his son Jesus so that we can find freedom through him. Amen? But when we sin, the Bible says that a godly sorrow... That moment of knowing that you have failed God, that moment of knowing that you have disobeyed God, that you have broken the heart of God, it said that sorrow. It's not shame, there's a difference, but that kind of sorrow, it says, brings repentance. Repentance, the word actually means to change your way of thinking. It doesn't just simply mean that, you know, we, we wash ourselves off from our sin, but it actually means to return to a higher way of thinking. What is the higher way of thinking that we need? His thinking. Amen. For his thoughts are not what? Our thoughts. And his ways are not our ways. But his thoughts are much higher. And his ways are much higher. Amen. So we need to trust in God. Godly sorrow brings repentance. A change of thinking that leads to salvation. I want to be saved, don't you? Amen. I said I want to be saved. You know, salvation the epitome of salvation is that day when the Lord will call you home. It is that day when he would say, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. How many of you want to be there on that day? Amen. How many of you want to hear those blessed words? Well done, good and faithful servant. Godly sorrow brings repentance. It leads to salvation and it leaves no regret. I've been regretful of mistakes and choices that I have made in my life. But when you repent and when you say, Lord, I trust you, Lord, you are, your way is better. When you get to that place in your, in your repentance, in your godly sorrow, you get to that place and you know that, that it's only through him that we can be forgiven. Christ is the bridge between us and the Father. And when we receive him and we receive his love in our life, we don't have to regret anything that we would ever miss out in this world. Sometimes we think that choosing Jesus is, is oh, well, i got to give up all these things. i gotta, I got to, you know, change my life. And, and, you know, I've talked to people about choosing Jesus, and they say, well, I'm not ready to give up this and that. And the fact is, is they're right. Choosing Jesus and deciding to follow Christ means that you leave everything behind. Amen means that you leave your pride behind, you leave your mind behind, you leave, you leave your ways behind, you leave all the things that you were once carrying in this world, you leave them behind. But it goes on to say, but worldly sorrow brings death. Why do, what is the worldly sorrow? It's the sin. 
It's the wages of sin. It's knowing that what you have done has offended the heart of God. And there is no bridge otherwise but through salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's keep on going. The second thing that we learned was that the person that hurts at the suffering of others becomes a source of comfort. How many of you have ever, you know, you, you've, you've seen, you know, a, a news article and, and you heard that there was people that were innocently and violently killed? And you see things like this every single day and it breaks your heart, doesn't it? At least it should. It should break your heart because you desire to see justice. You desire to see somebody's life, you know, you know a life was taken. You say, Lord, give that family justice. You think if it was your own child or family member and you say, oh, my Lord, help them, Jesus. Help them. And that pain that you, that you see, that hurt that you feel at the suffering of another person, it actually can become a source of comfort from your life. It can become a source of comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Who comforts us in our troubles. How many of you have ever been comforted by the Lord? Amen. The Holy Spirit is so powerful that when, when you're going through a trial, when you're going through pain or anguish or trauma in your life, He is there. He's ready to embrace you. He's ready and willing to comfort your life. It says He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Ernie Kemper said this, he says, whatever you suffer, remember that someday you will comfort somebody else with the strength that you have found from God. And that's the truth. We are a living testimony of what the Lord can do in our life. Amen. We are a living testimony that all of a sudden that strength that we have found in God, we can uh, apply that, we can use that, we can embrace somebody else with the comfort and the love that the Lord offers us. Amen. How many of you are thankful for God's love tonight? God is so good. Let's continue on. If you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5 is where we're going to be reading tonight. And this will be our verse of discussion tonight. It says this, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Everybody read it with me. Open your mouth and say, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Father, we just thank you, Lord, tonight for all that you've done. And we thank you for the power of your word tonight, Lord. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that we too can be inheritors of everything that you have promised according to your word. And so speak through me tonight, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want us to go ahead and define what the word meek means. That word meek, if you're taking notes, it means to have a strong but tender and humble life. It is a strong yet teachable spirit. Amen. It's not being weak, bowing, or spineless, but it is a man who is strong, yet they are humble and tender. It is a man with all the emotions and ability to take and conquer, but he is able to control himself. That's a good word. I'll say that one more time. It's an individual with, with the ability and the emotions to take and conquer. How many of you know that we are called to be victorious in this life? Amen. But in order to get to victory, you have to go through some battles. You can't be weak-minded to be in the army of the Lord. The moment that you said yes to Jesus, you entered into a battlefield, my friend. And that requires courage, amen. That requires strength. That requires leaning on the Holy Spirit. That requires a dependence on him. That means that we put on the full armor of God, amen. And that we wield the sword of the Spirit every single day. It says they are an individual that has the emotions the, and the ability to take and to conquer. But they are able to control themselves. It is discipline and a man discipline because they are God controlled. You have all the power. You carry the authority of God in your life, yet you are God controlled. The opposite of meekness is arrogance and pride. A meek person knows that he has needs but does not have all of the answers. 
We know that we have needs. We know that we have issues. We know that we have things and, and, and things that we deal with in this life. But guess what? We realize that we don't have all of the answers. Amen? And so this definition of meekness simply defined is this. It's power under control. How many of you have ever driven a, a fast car? Has anybody ever driven a, a muscle car? Not just a fast car. I'm going to say a muscle car. How many of you have ever driven a muscle car? I had the opportunity of driving a, a, a friend of mine, actually my cousin's, uh, I think it was an 85 Mustang 5.0. Not, not too bad car, and I think it had around 500 horsepower. You could get in that car and you could, you could just go like this and tap the gas and it would snap your neck. Power. I'm talking, that was Power. I drove my other uncle's IROC Z. How many of you remember those, those Chevy IROC Zs? Those are not found anywhere today, but it was this Chevy IROC Z. One time I was on the highway and I was young and dumb, so forgive me. But I'm being honest with you tonight. I was on the highway and I was going about uh, 85 miles an hour, which is not too fast. But when you peel out going 90 miles an hour, that's, that's, an, that's another story. You're already going 85 miles an hour. And then you, you step on it a little more and you go, Arr! And you just keep going. Now, if you're young and you're inexperienced and you don't know how to handle a vehicle of such power, you will what? Lose control. My very same cousin that owned that Mustang got in an accident and unfortunately a young woman died. You can carry the authority of God in your life, my friends, but you can use it to kill people. You can carry the authority of God in your life and you can say, I am a Bible-wielding son of, son of the Most High God. I am a child of God. But yet you can use that very thing that God has given you and the authority that he has given you to actually curse people instead of curse Satan. You can use that very thing that God has given you to tear down the lives of individuals instead of go after the, go after the root of the issue, which is Satan himself. Can I tell you that it's demons inside of an individual that cause an individual to do demonic things? I don't cast out the individual. You cast out the demon. Amen. The Bible says he hasn't given us the power and the authority of God to trample on snakes and scorpions and to rebuke your neighbor and to cast them out. He didn't give you the authority to use as, as, a, as a sword to destroy somebody's life, but he's given you his authority, church, so that we can go into this world and use the authority and the power of God to cast out Satan, to cast out the enemy, to cast him out of our communities and our families and our schools and our neighborhoods and our homes. It's not just something that we use to say, you know what, I've got this power, therefore I'm better than everybody else in the world. You'll never win somebody that you are, you know, you're destroying with the sword. Peter, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, what happens? The Bible says that, that Jesus was taken into captivity and Peter pulls out a sword. He goes, wham! And he cuts off that soldier's ear and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Peter's like, me? You talking about me, Jesus? Why? He said, put the sword back. What was he doing? Satan aroused in the life of Peter to what? To destroy a man's life and to destroy his ear. But ultimately, what was he trying to do? He was ultimately trying to stop the plan and the will of God. That's why he said, get behind me, Satan. Power under control, church. Power under control. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, the tender, and the humble. Those who depend on God for their answers. He said that they would inherit the earth. How many of you have ever hoped to inherit something? Amen. Everybody in here is like waiting that you, you pray that you had that rich aunt or uncle or grandpa or grandma. It owns like 10,000 acres, you know, with all the kinds of delicious deer on it. Amen. I said that. I think deer are delicious. Every time I see deer out in the field, I see them with like tortillas and pico de gallo on them. Sorry, I'm a hunter. That's just the way I think. 
you've ever hoped to inherit something like land or property or cars or hidden treasure, something good, amen? And Jesus explains this. He says, he tells us clearly that those who are meek, they would have the opportunity to inherit the earth. In other words, everything is possible for him who believes, amen? Simply put, everything is impossible for him who believes. But here's the deal. It's the meek that inherit the earth. You cannot leave out the posture and the discipline of who the Lord is calling us to be. So who are the meek? Let's ask ourselves this question tonight. Who are the meek? It is that person that has self-control and is not undisciplined. How many of you like discipline? Amen. Your doctor says, hey, listen. You've gained a couple pounds. You've got a few pounds overweight. You've got to watch your diet. Anybody like that conversation with the doctor? No. <laughs> Nobody's going to like that conversation with the doctor. He says, hey, your cholesterol is high. Your blood doesn't look good. Listen, you need to discipline yourself. But, Lord, I love Whataburger. <laughs> oh, doctor, I love my, my donuts and my coffee. And, oh, doctor, I love this and I love that. And there's no discipline in your life. Many times we see people that have no self-control. In today's world, it looks like things like this, like party goers and, and drug addicts and easily angered people and people that dabble in different forms of sin. These are undisciplined people that have no self-control. A person that has self-control is a person whose mind and body are disciplined and they are never let loose. How many of you have ever seen that thing that's in a, in a horse's mouth? How many of you? What's it called? A bit, right? It's called a bit. And the rider of that horse, when, when, they, when they move it and they, they tug at it, the, the horse goes, ugh. Right? He, he stops. He has to stop because he has this bit that's controlling his mouth. Not to compare us to horses, but I will. I take the liberty to do so. If he is Lord of your life, you have to allow him to go, whoa. You have to allow the bridling of the Holy Spirit to control your tongue, control your actions, control your thoughts, your behaviors, your coming, and your going. Amen. Because they're never let loose. Their passions and their urges, their speech and behavior, their sight and their touch are always under control of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12 says this. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Don't let sin reign in your life. Don't let sin reign in your life so that all of a sudden it has control over you. 1 Corinthians 6 and 12 says this, Everything is permissible for me. This is Paul speaking. He said, but not everything is beneficial. I've said this before, I'll say it again. There's a lot of people in here, most of us in here I believe are 21 and over. That means there are permissible things that by the federal law of this United States, you are able to do. You could go buy alcohol because you're over 21 years old, yes? You could go to clubs and you could go to certain places, yes? You could buy cigarettes, you, yes? You could do all kinds of things. They are actually permissible for you to do. But are they beneficial? What would they lead you into? They can lead you into a life of sin. They can lead you into a life of alcoholism. They can lead you into a life of drunkenness. They can lead you into a life of sexual perversion and sexual immorality. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. At the end of the day, the most, uh, most aware thing that I need to be aware about is my relationship with God. I need, be, need to be more aware about my relationship with, with who he is and, and what I am that, that I am not, you know, giving my attention to anything else that this world would offer me. Everything else is inferior to Jesus. Everything, he says, is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Paul said, I will not be mastered by anything. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 26 he says, so therefore I do not run like a man running aimlessly. A man running aimlessly has no target. He has no destination. He's just like, ah, you know, he's just running around like a crazy guy. He has no end point to wherever it is that he's going. He says, I don't run that way. I don't run like a man running aimlessly or 
undisciplined. He said, I do not fight like a man beating the air. He said, no, I beat my body and I make it slave so that after I preach to others, that is the practice of self-control. He said, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul said, this thing is so important that if I don't get it right, I could be disqualified. That at the very end of this race, I may get to the finish line and be going a completely different direction. Your body, church, is to be under the discipline and the reign of him who you call Lord, and that should be Jesus. Everybody say, help me, Holy Spirit. In these verses, it talks about not letting sin control you. The temptation of sin is not only physical, but it's spiritual. Sin attacks us both physically and spiritually. And if we are not controlled by the Holy Spirit, we have no defense against sin. Sin attacks in, in such ways, church, that, that, that you won't have you know, defense against it unless the Spirit of God reigns in your life. If sin is your master, then slavery is the spirit under which you operate. I'll say it one more time. If sin is your master, then slavery is the spirit under which you operate. But if the Holy Spirit is your master, then self-control is possible. Amen. Sometimes we think, we say, you know, Pastor, I just, I can't kick this habit. Pastor, I, I, I can't get over this. Pastor, I can't, I can't stop doing this thing. I, I just, I always do it. It's got a control. It's got a hold. It's got a grip on your life. And ultimately, that hold and that grip will choke you out. It will lead you to disqualification. It will take you out of the race. And it will take you to a place that you do not want to go. And so every single day, the meek say, Holy Spirit, you are my master. Help me take this body under control. Colossians chapter 3 talks about daily putting to death. Daily putting to death the things that come to attack us. The sin that, that rises up in our life and the sin that is trying to entangle us. It's trying to choke us out. It's trying to snuff the life out of us, church. The Holy Spirit is your master, then self-control is possible. You might say, well, Pastor Duke, I've always been this way. Then Jesus died for nothing. If he can't break a curse of sin in your life, then he's not God. But I've known him to break every curse in my life. I've known him to break every chain. I've known him to set captives free. I've known him to set people into freedom because he alone in his name, church, is the only thing and the only one who is able to break every chain and every demonic force that would come to attack your life. Only through Jesus, church. Romans chapter 7 and verse 18 says this, I know that nothing good lives in me. This is Paul talking. He said, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I want to do is, is for, he says, for what I do is not the good I want to do. He said, no, the evil I do not want to do is the thing that I keep doing. He says, now if I do what I do not want to do, man, there's a lot of do's and nots and <laughs> Let me slow down. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. Paul was saying, I have a will, but it is so overpowered by the lust of sin that I'm helpless. This is what he's saying. He said, my passion is stronger than my reason. He's saying, my will and my reason and my understanding and my conscience are on God's side. And my consent to his will and to his law. But my slave master will not consent for me to serve God or his law. Sin was controlling his life. Are you disciplined, church? Are you disciplined? Are you meek? If you're lacking in any area of your life, then ask the Lord to pour out his strong Holy Spirit in your life. Luke chapter 11, verse 11 says, Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? He said, if, if, or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. He said, if you then, though you are evil, now know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? 
The Bible says that we have not because we what? We ask not. If some kind of sin is reigning in your life, you have not because you ask not. Ask him, church. Ask him and say, Lord, break this chain in my life. Lord, set me free in this area. Romans 8 and 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? He is able, church. He is able. He is able. But it's us asking the Holy Spirit to fill our heart and our life so that we are no longer controlled by the sinful nature, but we stand above it with the chosen method of Christ, which is by giving us his Holy Spirit. Meekness, church, cannot be attained by simply changing your attitude. Pastor uses a phrase a lot, and it's so true. Attitude determines altitude. But you can't think your way into a sin-free life. That's the truth. I'm not saying what pastor said is wrong. I'm just simply saying that you cannot think your way into a sin-free life. Meekness cannot be attained by simply changing your attitude alone, but it all starts with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, and his fruit will be meekness in your life. We need to become a people that are disciplined in the word of God. Amen. Be disciplined in the word of God. Be disciplined and know what the word says and know what the Father's heart says concerning you and me. Knowing our identity in Christ, knowing how the, the, the word is and, and how powerful of a tool that the word of God actually is. We need to be disciplined in the action and the lifestyle of prayer. Amen. We need to be a people that pray more. Amen. I said we need to be a people that pray more. We need to make this a disciplined area of your life. I love my brother Prince and Daniel and those guys, and we had several opportunities where we fasted and we prayed together, and man, talk about those guys can pray. Woo-wee. I thought I could pray for a minute. Next thing you know, we're into like hour three, and I'm going like, I ain't got much else to say, Lord, <laughs> you know. The discipline, though, comes from the action. You have to keep doing it. If, if you say, you know what, well, I can't run 10 miles. Well, if you don't run one, you'll never get to 10. But if you run one repeatedly, guess what? Two, two becomes attainable. Amen. And guess what? All of a sudden, if you're able to run two, then three becomes a little bit more achievable. What's the point? The point is, is that you need to be disciplined in prayer. That means you need to keep doing it. You need to pray every single day. You need to read the word every single day. You need to worship every single day. I'm so glad that, we, the, that the worship was, was the way that it went this evening because that is a discipline as well. Some of you cross your arms in worship and sit down early and be like, well, is it halftime yet? And you're sitting there, you're waiting all of a sudden, well, I, they're in song three. That means that they're almost done. Listen, listen, worship is a discipline. Did you realize that all of eternity in heaven is going to be one big worship service? If you get bored here, then guess what? I don't know what else to tell you. You're not going to be very happy up there then. We need to learn the discipline and the art of bowing before the Lord in worship now, church. Amen. This is what discipline looks like. We need to be disciplined in our behavior. We need to be disciplined in our speech. We need to be disciplined in what we look at. We need to be disciplined in our deeds. Letting God's spirit and his word come in and being accountable to what the word is telling you and being accountable to what you've heard. That is discipline. We are not going to wake up one day and say, you know, when Jesus calls us home and say, God, you know what, I just didn't know that verse. I'm sorry. The Bible says that he has given us everything. Everybody say everything. Everything for life and godliness. That means you lack absolutely nothing. If you lack anything, the Bible says in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. That means that you don't know what this thing says, that you don't know what the word of God says concerning your life. That is the area and the gateway for the enemy to destroy your life. Be disciplined in the word of God and allow it to work in transformation in your life. 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 7 says this, For the spirit God gave us does not make you timid. 
Other versions say it is not a spirit of fear, right? But it goes on to say, but he gives us power, he gives us love, and he gives us self-discipline. Other, word, uh, other versions use the word self-control or a sound mind. Amen. A sound mind means that you're able to make godly decisions. Amen. And self-control is the way to be able to make the godly decision. To not choose what you would want to choose in a given situation, but wait for the answer from God and say, Lord, I'll do what you are asking me to do. I will wait for what your spirit is telling me to do. But the spirit of God is powerful, church. It's love, but it gives us the ability to have self-discipline. The second thing that we see here is a person that is meek is a person who is humble and not prideful. A person who is meek is a person that is humble and not prideful. In our world, everyone desires to take pride in something. Either in themselves or in somebody or in something. People take pride in their own accomplishments. People take pride in the success of others that they know or people that they wish they knew. People take pride in sports teams. People take pride in their church, etc. But listen, pride is God repellent. You want to keep God out of your life? Just keep acting like you've got all the answers. You want to keep God at bay in your life and in constant resistance to you? Then just act like you know it all. He's not going to move in your life if you think that you know it all. (laughs) How many of you love mosquitoes? Raise your hand. (laughs) Mosquitoes are an interesting creation of God. (laughs) I don't understand why the Lord would make mosquitoes. Maybe I'll get a chance to ask him one day. But he's perfect in all of his ways, so I'll trust that he knew what he was doing. But we've all bought mosquito repellent, amen? And you smell like fumes, you know, afterwards. Then some of you tried the all-natural stuff. Good luck with that. I need chemicals, man, to keep these valley mosquitoes off of my life. <laughs> right? You know, you need, some, you need some stuff that's like, you know, really potent and strong. But they still might get you. Pride is the very thing that will repel God from your life. The Bible says that he resists the proud. To have the God of the universe go like this, saying, you're not moving towards me. I'm not letting you come into my presence. I'm going to stop you right there. That is something that must be dealt with In our life. Can somebody say amen tonight? Pride will position you for resistance and not acceptance and receptivity from God. Humility, as in being a person that is humble before others and before God, is a required status for encountering God. Humility, I will say it again, is a required status for encountering God. The Bible tells us that there was a declaration of God's word and his will. And Moses and Aaron, how many of you remember Moses and Aaron? They were two pretty good guys. Moses and Aaron, they went to the palace of Pharaoh and they asked a key question to Pharaoh. And they said this, they said, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before God? They were the servants of God. They were the leaders of the Israelites, the ones that would lead them out of Exodus, out of the Egyptian slavery. And they they go up to Pharaoh. They said, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before God? Now, remember that Pharaoh had professed his sin and he promised to obey God. That sounds like national leaders that I've heard make promises before. They promised to obey God. They promised to look a certain way. They promised to uphold the values of Christian values of our nation, one nation under God. But yet what? They don't look, live, or act anything or truly know the one that they're trying to endorse themselves by. Pharaoh had professed his sin and he promised to obey God and he had promised to repent of his hardness against God and to free God's people in Exodus chapter 9. But once the former judgment had passed, he soon forgot his confession and promises. I know that nobody in the house of God has ever done that. 
You make all kinds of promises to God on a Sunday morning. You come to the altar and say, Lord, I'll never do that again. Lord, I'll never. God, I'll, I'll serve you all the days of my life. I've decided to follow you, Jesus. All the promises in the world on Monday morning, you've already let them go. You've broke them all. He soon forgot his confession and promises, and he turned away from God, more hardened in his heart than ever. He became stubborn and stiff-necked, obstinate and unyielding to God. Exodus 10 and 3 says this, So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, This is what the Lord God of the Hebrews says. He said, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? He says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. You see, if you feel, if you desire to feel God and, and, and experience the Lord in a time of worship, then you have to allow the Spirit of God to break you from yourself. To break yourself down so that God can come in. So that the Lord of glory can come into your life. That is, you have to humbly admit and renounce your own pride before God. Sometimes we walk into a worship setting thinking like we belong there. And instead of bowing down to the one who has entered the room. Dusting ourselves off and say the king of glory is here. I'm not worthy to stand in your presence. I'm not worthy to belong in the same room as you. You have to humbly admit and renounce your pride before God. Some things in our life church could be a refusal to change. We have these hardened areas in our life that the Lord wants to deal with. Amen. A refusal to change. It could be denying what God is doing around you. It could be self, self, selfishness. It could be you being upset at a situation that didn't go your way. But whatever it is, you see God's people, in this case, they were in bondage, church. And they were unable to worship the Lord and encounter God because of the pride of Pharaoh. And the reason that Jesus died for our sins was to abolish and destroy that spirit of Pharaoh in all of us. It was to destroy that very work of pride that sometimes rises up in our life, that wicked spirit that comes upon your flesh to control you and keep you enslaved to your own evil thoughts and desires and lust of the flesh. This is why Jesus Christ came to give his life for you. Romans chapter 7 and verse 4 says this, My brothers and sisters... You also died through, to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another. To him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. He goes on to say, for when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, that we bore fruit for death. Verse 6, but now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. You see, humility opens the door to be freed from the law and to be freed from the slavery of sin and free from the opposition of the enemy. It opens the door for all of it. Humility. The meek are humble for God. That is, they know and they recognize and they've identified their need for God and God's hand upon their life. They, that their need to be saved and to be controlled by God. They're humble before men and they know that they're not the epitome of mankind and the summit of knowledge amongst men. But they realize, church, that they do not have it all nor do they know it all. This is what humility looks like. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 through 5 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also the interest of others. And it goes on to say that your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. That is, we are to adopt an attitude of humility. First Peter chapter 5 in verse 5, it says this, Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourselves in humility towards one another. Because God opposes the proud, but he what? He gives grace to the humble. He says, so humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. 
Verse 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God will lift and deliver the lowly. Amen. And finally, a person who is meek is an individual that is gentle and not easily provoked. The meek are always in control when dealing with people. Remember, power under control. They're cool. They're even-tempered. They're able to show displeasure without reacting impulsively. And they're able to answer softly. We have to ask ourselves these questions. Do we have these traits in our life? Do we have these fruits of the Spirit? Is this how we react to people? 2 Timothy chapter 2 says this, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Do not have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. What do we not understand about what the scripture says? The people that engage in this activity are foolish and stupid. I didn't say it. It's the word. Don't have anything to do with those things. Because at the end of the day, we are to be a representative of the kingdom of God. That is, we are called to be ambassadors of the cross of Christ. And if we go around in pride trying to prove our point to everybody, then guess what? All you're doing is dismissing people from the kingdom. Because at the end of the day, all they're doing is you are, are, are offering your opinion to their opinion on a matter. And guess what? At the end of the day, our opinion does not matter. It's what the Word of God says. You can get into conversations about anything. Ford, Chevy. Favorite color, whatever. Sports teams, whatever. And at the end of the day, what do they accomplish? What do they accomplish? What is your education? What is your life? What is the, the work of your hands? What is it accomplishing for you if it's not exalting the king in his kingdom? It's rubbish. At the end of the day, we count it all loss. We count it all loss so that we can gain Christ. There are things in our hearts and our lives that we need to give up. This is one of them. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. Verse 24, everybody say, read this with me. Verse 24, and the Lord's servant, how many of you serve Jesus? Amen. Amen. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right, here we go. We're all, we're all accountable to this one now. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone Able to teach and not resentful. Yeah, you know the guy that you cut off on the way to church this evening. <laughs> you must be kind to everyone. You must be able to teach. That is, you must know what it is that you believe. I should be able to ask anybody in this building to stand up and tell me what the gospel is in 30 seconds. And you should have a clear and educated answer. You should know that mankind fell into sin because of the serpent and know that, that it was Eve that, that took the apple and know that we were doomed from that point on. But God said, listen, I'm not going to allow my people to be doomed, but I'm going to give them re re redemption and I'm going to give them hope and I'm going to give them a savior. And he's going to come through a virgin birth and he's going to be saved. He's going to be the salvation of those who would be the sinners of this world and we're going to give our lives to him. You should be able to speak the gospel. You should be able to know what it is that you're talking about, know what it is that you profess and believe, but there's people that don't believe in God. They're atheists. They're, they're, they're people that, that don't believe in Jesus whatsoever, that know this word better than us sometimes. 
They're able to stand up to you in an argument and refute you and debate you and put you in your place and you don't even know what you're talking about. At the end of the day, we need to know that Christ and we need to know Christ of this letter. We need to have an intimate and personal and daily relationship with him so that we what? We're able to be kind to everyone. We're able to teach. And we're what? We're not resentful. Resent is like the cousin of unforgiveness. When you resent somebody, it's because they did something towards you or to your life or they said something about your life. And all of a sudden you look at them a different way and and you're just resentful. You're spiteful towards them. Get a little bothered when they walk in the room. We are to be people of forgiveness. We need to be a church and a body of believers, a group of adults and young adults that stand out from everybody else. They're not fighting, they're not arguing, they're not gossiping. But guess what? Maybe the person you're having a foolish argument with needs Jesus. <laughs> Jerry Bridges said this, gentleness is an active trait describing the manner in which we should treat others. Meekness is a passive trait describing the proper Christian response when others mistreat us. How many of you know that Jesus said when they hit you, hit them back? (laughs) That's not what he said. Amen? He said if they hit you on the cheek, what do you do? Give them the other one. When are we going to stop fighting with the world that Jesus is trying to save? (laughs) When are we going to stop arguing with the world that God is trying to redeem? Amen. When are we going to stop, you know, getting after a people that God is trying to deliver and we're the ones that are standing in the way? One of the greatest walls, one of the greatest things that, that is in the way for people to accepting Jesus are Christians. <laughs> Whose team are we really on? Whose team are we really on if we are the individual that becomes the stumbling block to somebody else to be believing in Jesus? Jesus had strong words for those that would be a stumbling block to his children. He said, it is better for them to tie a millstone around their neck and throw themselves into the depths of the sea than to cause any one of these little ones from coming to me. When all of a sudden we're the issue. We're the one that, that's, that's, that's repelling people out of the church. We're the one that's, that's the judge and, the, and the, the person that's condemning and the person that's shaming people. That is not our job, church. Our job is to love people with the love that you and I have received with Christ. Our job is to preach the word and love, to teach this world, to, to show them what salvation looks like. This is what we are supposed to do. Maybe you're that person and you find yourself speaking about is dealing with something serious. That individual that you're conversing with, maybe they're dealing with something serious at home and they just need an embrace with, from a friend. They don't need argument and they don't need backbiting and they don't need, you know, convincing. We need to be gentle and sensitive to the needs of others around us. If someone has their head down, encourage them. If you see somebody that's weeping and hurting, embrace them and love them. This is what Jesus would do. First Timothy 6.11, but you man of God, flee from all those things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Why all the meekness stuff? Why all the unselfishness, prideless, gentle stuff? Because the meek inherit the earth now. That is, we presently enjoy and experience the good things of Jesus in this earth. What does this mean? Quickly, the inheritance of the land means three things. Peace, prosperity, and promise. Psalm 37 verse 11 says, The meek will inherit the land and they will enjoy peace and prosperity. That's the peace part. Numbers 6 and 26 says the Lord will turn his face towards you and he will give you peace. His face towards us, church, is an offering of peace and our face towards him receives that which he gives us. 
When the Lord looks at you, if he, he has the ability to release peace upon your life. But are you looking to the Lord for peace? The prosperity of God is far more than wealth that is earned in this earth. But rather it's an inheritance of far greater Romans 4 verse 13 says it's not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world. But it was through righteousness that comes by faith. You see, you're not automatically in the kingdom just because you say the name of Jesus. There is a lifestyle of righteousness that needs to match its maker. There is a lifestyle in which we are to walk in that needs to represent him well. It goes on to say that they would be an, inher- an heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. And that promise of heirship did not come through the law, but it came by the Abraham, the covenant that God gave Abraham of faith in Genesis 12. Let's read the verses, verse 1. The Lord said to Abraham, go far from your country and your people and your father's household to the land. I will show you and I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. He said, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. He said, and I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. All the people of the earth will be blessed through you. Are you the blessing and are you living out the inheritance that God has paid to give you now? Are you a blessing to those around you? Has your name been made great that you would be a blessing to others? Because he will bless you and he will curse those who curse you and all the people of the world will be blessed through your life. You see, that's prosperity, and that's true prosperity. And the promise looks like this. Your belief in Christ sets up the righteous for their eternal reward. It sets up the righteous for their eternal reward. Now, that's good news, my friend, because in Matthew 25, verse 34, it says, The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's good news tonight. That's good news because, see, listen, the inheritance of the earth is not just something that you can acquire in this earth and leave nothing with. You're not going to an eternity with Jesus with anything that this earth has to offer you. But the ultimate inheritance of the earth would be that one day you would walk in this earth with the authority and the dominion that God has given you. And you would walk in such a way that you would walk in righteousness. You would walk in faith. You would walk in as an example of Jesus wherever it is that you go. And when you do that, and as you do that, your reward is certain. And your reward is sure that one day you will come into the courts of God and you will be blessed by the Father and you will take your inheritance. The Bible says that he is going to prepare a good place for us, church. He said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming back to take you to be with me where I am forever. I want us to be remembered, church, by our humility and our ability to be a blessing to serve others in this world. That's how I want Rock of Ages to be remembered. By our ability to be a blessing, to serve people in this world. Jesus said, he did not come to be served, but to what? To serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. To give his life as a ransom for many. I desire, church, what Christ wants me to be. Our desire should be what Christ wants us to be. Remember, it's not about your choice. It's about his will. It's not our plans, but it's about His. Not our life, but His. A.W. Tozer said, Jesus calls us to rest, and meekness is His method. The meek man cares not at all who is greater than he, for he has decided long ago that the esteem of the world is not worth the effort. See, one day, church, we're going to make it to heaven, but first we must adopt the attitude and humility that Christ offers us in this earth in order to make it to heaven. As I ask you to stand to your feet tonight. 
want us to read that verse one more time. Matthew 5 and 5. Everybody read it with me. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit.